Much better now, eh? Yeah. Okay, we are recording now. Um, great. So I would like to welcome everyone to our first online panel discussion. Um, we're titling this The Circus Community Response to COVID-19. And what we've done is we've gathered some experts together from around the world in the circus sector. We're going to introduce everyone very shortly. Um, but what we're here to do is to discuss the world response in the circus community, particularly, and the repercussions to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a lot of cancellations are happening, as we all know, around the world to shows and to festivals. Uh, circus schools are closing. It's happening daily. We keep getting more and more updates. This is a global uh, issue. Um, we know that the impact on our health is intense. We want to talk about the impact on our mental health, on our physical health, and on our economical health. Uh, it's going to be very intense with the performing arts, particularly because it's springtime, there's new shows, there's new festivals, world premieres, circus graduates who are about to enter the world. Oh, hi, Nikki. I'm glad you're here. Circus, uh, circus graduates who are about to enter the workforce are now going to be sort of left hanging, possibly. We don't have all the answers. It's very clear we're not going to have all the answers today. But I think it's important that we get the conversation started. And uh, we have this diverse group of people here to discuss it. So uh, let's just briefly talk about our goals today uh, to talk about the different regions and the impacts that we know it's having on your particular region, uh, to discuss the impact it's having on artists and organizations, uh, employment wise, health wise, and to explore support systems, alternative employment, recommended steps from the governments and from institutions. Um, let's start by introducing everyone. Uh, Adolfo. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adolfo, Adolfo Rossomando. Uh, I'm from Italy. I'm the director of uh, Jackley Magazine, Circus Art Magazine, and also the president of a national umbrella for development of youth circus, social circus in Italy. Thank you, Adolfo. Matthew? Hello. My name is Matthew Jessner. I'm living in Belgium, working at the moment with Dagan, having worked for a number of years with the Cirque du Soleil as well, and responsible from an operational standpoint for six shows that are actually running at the moment. Well, actually not running, but the bodies of work are there. And uh, we're in the front line of the COVID and also uh, the ways that we're dealing with it from an internal social and local social standpoint. Thank you, Matthew. Vicky? Hello, hi, I'm Vicky Medemi. I'm the artistic director of Upswing, which is a contemporary circus company based in the UK. Um, we are an MPO, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, I'm also coordinator of the Equity Circus Network. So Equity is the union that represents the performing arts, um, individuals in the performing arts in the UK. Um, and I coordinate the circus element of that. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, Deb? You have to unmute. Sorry, I was busy listening. Um, I'm Deb um, and I'm in Brisbane, Australia. Um, I run a company called Cluster Arts and we are producers of circus and physical theatre. So we tour and produce um, circus pretty much in Australia and all around the world. Thank you, Deb. How about you, Vincent? So hi, I'm Vincent Messager from uh, Montreal. I'm a touring agent for Cirque Alphonse, Barcode, and small, some smaller circus company. And I also teach uh, career management at the National Circus School in Montreal. Thank you, Vincent. Stefan? Hi, everyone. I'm Stefan. I work for Artsena, the French National Center for Circus, Street Arts, and Theatre, and I coordinate Circo Strada Network. Great. Uh, Nikki. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Nikki Miller. Sorry I had some technical difficulties joining you. Um, I'm an independent circus artist and educator in New York City and uh, have been involved here in um, sort of trying to get ahead of the potential implications of just the population density here and the number of studios we have and recognizing that that's just one example of something that probably exists all over the place. Um, so uh, honored to be here and offer whatever insight I can from that perspective. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Veronica? Can you hear us? 
Veronica, you're frozen at the moment. Okay, we'll come back to you when we see that uh, your, attack, your connection is better. Um, I'd like to start with a question for you, Deb. Um, artisan shows in Australia, as you have said, are an optimistic bunch. Uh, you're a lively bunch of artists. Um, but coming on the heels of the devastation of the wildfires, what's the pulse in Australia right now? Are the artists feeling demoralized um, because of all the natural disasters or is the attitude pretty healthy? Um, I think there's a, there's a bit of a mixture, but I think there's a dawning realization. So the F, the eternal optimism of artists is something that, I mean, it's just wonderful. And I think over the last few weeks, as we've heard the media and, um, and, and things grow and, um, the coronavirus spread throughout the world, there was a sort of a starting point of, oh, this is just crazy. This is an overreaction. Um, and now as it's sort of our borders have been closed today, so um, you now have to, or not closed, but you have to go into ice, um, enforced isolation, any international travellers coming into the country wow. um, as, as of today. So um, obviously now it's affecting artists and I think the realisation that their income for the next three to six months is severely affected um so there's there still is incredible australians are very buoyant and i think we show that in the bushfires um the talk around artists were performing for us to perform for free to raise money in our recent bushfires and now our artists are the ones that are needing to be looked after um, and they need some help yeah Oh, well, that's unfortunate. I see, Veronica, are you available to introduce yourself now? Uh, still having connection issues. Okay. Uh, my next question is for you, Matthew. Um, Dragon has canceled shows in China several weeks ago when the outbreak began. Um, in a lot of ways, Dragon and China, you're ahead of everyone else in this crisis. What measures did you take um, to help the artists and the shows? And what would you advise theaters and circus companies to do at this point? Well, there's not, uh, from a public health perspective, there's no distinction between circuses or anything, really. It, there's, there are certain governmental uh, dictations, which are important. Obviously, we follow those and contribute to them. The, uh, one of the advantages that we have uh, in some of the shows that we do is that they've been running for a long time at the massive organizations. So in that, we already have done a huge internal education process for security protocols and everything else, and also internal communications. We have typhoon protocols. We have also health protocols from people that have any kind of communicable diseases. We had that in the Cirque du Soleil when people were freaking out about someone who had HIV and how we deal with that and all the rest of it. So rather than reinventing something, we need to knock on the door that's already open within our staff. People are educated. We have a communal response. We have what we call SOPs, which is standard operating procedures and all that. So because we've utilized that entire mechanism, it's really knocking on the door that's already open. So we have community forums, we have weekly meetings, and we have departmental meetings, and we make sure that everyone understands. We ask the questions and the Q&A and all the rest of it, and we do the communication, but rather than getting a memo, we do it on a very hands-on fashion, of course, at one meter five distance. But so it's really, in terms of the management, a different subject, but the same mechanism. So not to demystify the significance of it, but if you appeal to the intelligence of people, rather than spend all your time reassuring everybody, you get a collective response, which is really different. So um, I really uh, encourage us, I know I prepared for this somewhat, it's not to do a speech, but I, I thought about it a lot because we have a show in Wuhan. <laughs> Wuhan is the epicenter supposedly of this, <clears throat> and, and they're all circus communities. But because it's been a community for four years, but after a one and a half year creation period of developing how we operate within that building and all the rest of it, it with a huge international component, we have all the mechanisms to deal with all that. So uh, from a Dragon or Cirque du Soleil, which is a phenomenally well-coordinated uh, way that they're dealing with their touring, I'm still well-connected with them. From a Dragon, anyone else, I would propose if anyone has any questions about how we do this beyond this forum, please contact me. We can go on to all kinds of things that go from the training, how we 
be with the communications, not the PR, but the internal communications. And also for anyone that's teaching circus, it's a fantastic opportunity to use this as a, as a platform for where you're going in your careers, because it doesn't have to do with COVID, which is a subject matter which provokes this forum. It's very unfortunate that COVID would provoke this forum, but it's very positive that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So Thanks. this forum is to communicate what we're doing, but also amongst ourselves as a community. Okay. So please uh, contact me. And me is not me. Me is a huge body of people that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. We can share more amply about that. But are we doing well? Yes, we've closed down the shows. There will be repercussions. We're keeping the trainings on certain ones. Mm -hmm. We're taking care of our people. And also just on the positive side, with five large shows that have over 400 people just in show crew, no one in the greater community has been affected in any way. That's, that's very amazing, actually. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Stefan, I have a question for you. Um, Circus Strata and other organizations like FedEx and Peace, they're very well placed to help convey protocols and support to companies and artists. Have you been receiving many more requests for guidance? And uh, what is your organization uh, doing for, to help companies that have been halted, uh, whose work has been halted? And also and a few questions for you, Stefan, sorry. Um, are you advocating to the government for assistance at this point? Okay, I'm gonna try to answer those, maybe in an unorderly fashion. <laughs> um, first of all, what we have been doing is we compiled a list of resources and information together with On The Move, which is a mobility network, and it's freely available on the On The Move website. So you can go and check it out and it's updated regularly, not only by us and on the move, but by everyone who wants to put some new piece of information. Um, second of all, what we're going to do tomorrow, uh, we're going to launch either uh, a Google spreadsheet or, um, or I think a form, I don't know yet the, the shape it's going to take to survey how many festivals or show have been canceled across the world concerning circus and street arts, because we work for both. Uh, what I've encouraged some members is to work alongside other performing arts network, because it's not something that you can do by yourself, because we you know, we, we belong to a larger family and performing arts belong to a larger family and culture belongs to a larger family because everybody is in this even when you have a restaurant for instance uh what i know is that i don't think at this very stage us as a circus network or street art network advocating towards government will do anything let's not kid ourselves so the only thing is that we can do is to gather information for at some point maybe we can use it but right now ministers or public public representatives themselves are doing the job because i know that there have been talks already in uh, england because aca sent a message today finland is doing the same france is doing the same so they're thinking about developing either new schemes or adjusting existing one to cover some costs from the cancellations and uh, um, am I missing something from your question again? Or yeah, you're mute. Have Have you received a lot of emergency requests from artists and companies for guidance? Um, not directly. I've received one official um, letter from our Italian members. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I think they were the first to actually face this situation at the same stage where we're facing it in France or in other countries today. Yeah. So, which I shared with the steering committee of the network, which prompt us to do a series of action, which I'm going to share on Monday with the rest of the members. So we have right. sort of uh, some delay times to mm -hmm. process information and to, you know, share it because we have a, a certain level of governance that we have to you know apply and but i on monday that's the information that i'm going to share but i didn't receive directly from com i mean i've seen it on social media of course like everyone else um i'm just trying to keep track 
and uh, trying to also be solidaire with the people I know in the industry who are facing, you know, like a Biennial cancellation <laughs> or a festival cancellation mm -hmm. or a show cancellation. So, but I mean, we have to also to take into consideration the larger picture and not to, it's good that to have a, a conversation between ourselves for whatever it means, but uh, uh, it's, it's much larger and we need just to play a role where we are right now. Understood. Yeah, that's a good point, Stefan. Veronica, are you, uh, can you hear us? Can you introduce yourself? Well, I think, I think Veronica is still having difficulties. Okay. So Victoria, I have a question for you. Um, Upswing receives support from the Arts Council of England. Um, do you have faith that organizations like this will be able to advocate for the arts and to get emergency funding to help artists maintain a base income during this time? Uh, what alternative funding sources might artists tap into right now? <laughs> so I think it's it's important to recognize the context in which this is happening. Um, <clears throat> um, we have a situation in the UK where some organizations receive core funding from the Arts Council. They're a very small number. Um, there are about, I think, five MPOs. That's main business is Circus. Um, and we receive funding. I don't think there are any MPOs in the UK. An MPO is a national portfolio organization. So it's an organization that receives core subsidy from the Arts Council on a four year cycle. Um, there aren't any MPOs that are in the larger bands that get like a significant amount of funding. So we're all on kind of survival rations, as I call it. Um, <clears throat> The vast majority of people in the UK circus sector are independent freelancers. Um, and they normally at this point would turn to working in hospitality, um, you know, industries that are also feeling a massive crunch from the coronavirus um, epidemic. So it, it's, it's quite a difficult situation. I'm talking to a lot of people at the moment who are looking at completely empty summer seasons um and massive uncertainty about what's going to happen beyond then um the arts council today was re released a statement where they have recognized that 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 need is is present um and they are looking at how they can adjust some of their existing funding pots to deal with uh people experiencing loss of earnings We've had some governmental response, but all of our governmental response has been around people who experience sickness or need to self-isolate. So it hasn't really addressed what happens if you actually can't make any any money um, because of the, the situation, you know. And I think it's important to recognize that hardship, um, th that kind of financial hardship for independent artists is, is is, is a really, really difficult one to face. So the Arts Council England are responded, but they're very limited in terms of what they can do. You know, they haven't got endless pots of money and this is going to be a significant problem, not just across, uh, you know, the Arts Council support, theatre, dance, music, you know, every kind of, art, every other artistic practice in the UK. And circus is a very, very, very small part of their, um, their portfolio portfolio of uh, organizations as I said um, and it's a it's a sector that doesn't have a lot of infrastructure in the UK to support independent artists mm -hmm. so it's it's really challenging times it's it's really heartening to see that um, Arts Council are starting to respond to this um, I think they're limited in what they'll be able to do and we need to find other ways in which we can support each other yes I agree that's important to think about, and that's hopefully something we can discuss after we uh, ask everyone their question is uh, just what people are doing in their local communities. To yeah. Um, thank you, Vicki. Nikki, um, you're an artist, you're an instructor, and this past week you felt motivated to act really quickly on the topic of safety in circus spaces and edge in schools. Um, even now, um, schools and spaces are closing down, but at the time um, you were talking about um, protocols and working with uh, Steven Santos from uh, safety and what's it what's his uh, is it safety and aerial arts uh, yeah yeah okay. um, as more studios and schools close do you think that uh, this is the right decision for global health right now and what do you think the impact will be on the economic health of the students and educators right now 
And what do you hear in your community going around at this point? Um, yeah, well, I think it's absolutely the right thing for these spaces to be closing right now. Um, you know, my concern initially was around the um, lack of information of transmission and surfaces and, you know, the amount, you know, of the amount of things that we put our hands specifically on in a circus training space um, and the impossibility of washing hands in between every engagement with a, an object and whether that's an apparatus or, you know, the thing that really got me was when I, you know, I was like clocking like, okay, well, we could, you know, wash this, we could get like silks on rotation if we're, we're talking about fabric specifically and we could wash those and then we could dry others and then we could swap them out. But then it was like, oh no, but if you have like powder rosin, then all the students and all the instructors and whoever is there is going to be all putting their hands in the same powder rosin. So we can't use powder rosin. Well, we want to use spray, but we don't want to use aerosol and like just sort of recognizing all of these pieces and the complication of just like, um, of, of really doing that responsibly um, in, in some way that could be at all shared and like the, you know, which is really heartbreaking that, um, you know, this, this, you know, circus spaces function as a place where people come together to like have an embodied, you know, hangout, you know, and experience a shared, a shared time of being physical. And so um, it is, and, and, you know, and especially in New York, you know, we have, a ton of studios and they all function differently. Some are, you know, recreational classes that are, you know, yoga studios that offer aerial classes or pole studios. And some are like full, you know, circus, like multi-purpose circus spaces that are, you know, have school programs. Um, you know, we don't have credentialed schools here, like in, like in Europe and Canada, but, you know, we have schools that offer like pre-professional intensive programs. So students do enroll in a durational thing. Um, so the range of of places is pretty broad and the way that people engage with those places is really broad and we have a huge nightlife sector in new york so there's like a ton of gigger people who gig and perform on you know house apparatus in clubs and stuff like that so um just like anticipating all of this i i wanted to start to like propose some possibilities that occurred to me and make a working document that other folks could join on which is what i did and then steven santos um who's, you know, many of you, I don't know if you know, is like a very expert um, rigger and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very, very conscientious um, student of safety and, and physics and all right. of the materials. Uh, he started putting together his own document. And so we got in there uh, to sort of centralize information. And now it's just really clear that it just makes more sense for spaces to close. <laughs> One thing is, to um, note, though, Nikki, to note that, you know, even though at this point it does make sense for spaces to close, uh, as they predict that this um, illness will be around for a while, those sanitation techniques when spaces reopen will probably still be valid and needed. So it's good that you have shared that and continue to update it, and we appreciate that. And hopefully it's a resource that we can list in our resources with everyone else that is adding to their... Uh, documents today. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Adolfo, uh, you learned last week, or are you, you've been in quarantine for a while now, and we just learned this past week that Festival Up uh, is going to be canceled. Um, a lot of, I think, 30 plus shows are not happening. Um, again, Italy is a little ahead of the rest of the world in the thick of this pandemic. Where does this strike you on the I mean, is it because the pandemic is so intense there that this seems just like a minor thing to have these cancellations and it's necessary? Or are artists in your country um, still reeling from the economic uh, implications? And how do you think that we can all rebound from this quicker? Um, but this is, I think, is now very clear. And it was not clear two weeks ago that this is globally going over everywhere sooner mm -hmm. or later. And so this is already a different scenario from uh, two weeks or even one month ago. We thought in the beginning that China was so far away that this thing would stay in within China. And now, right now, Italy has been, yes, been locked down somehow. It's not complete lockdown like uh, in, in, the, in China, but people are staying home, asked to stay home for a week or two already. And... Uh, now we realize that we're part of this uh, big 
global society and market. There is no way that any country is going to uh, get rid of this by itself, because uh, even if we started the quarantine before, and maybe results will come before than in other countries, then we have to wait for the entire economy to restart again. And um, so the consideration, also there's so many European projects, there's so, so many networks, there's so much, uh, uh, we are so much mingled together that it's difficult that one country uh, start, survives or uh, comes out of this by itself. And uh, what we have done so far for the community, what, what we're doing within our organization is um, to uh, keep the people together, keep the people in touch. Okay, so we have, okay, of course, we have a forum that we exchange our views, so we uh, best practice, good practice, whatever ideas or whatever despair you have to share. And um, the second step is to start advoc advocating. Uh, at tables where uh, measures are already being taken for uh, um, for um, uh, uh, fighting you know, for fighting this uh, crisis, okay? Somehow, and we wrote to a Cisco Circo Strada the other day, and together with other partners in Italy, and this is already happening uh, uh, inside the Ministry of Culture and inside the government. There's already a lot of uh, advocating for each field. So these are the two, okay, the two, uh, the two uh, measures, okay, locally for the community and uh, in together with all the other sectors. And uh, so what we have to do, okay, first we have to see this uh, this uh, this um, COVID uh, escalation uh, slowing down and then stop. This is something nobody can predict anything because until this ending, there's nothing we can predict. And then after we have to consider how we can all bounce back, okay? Because there will be a time when this is over, but there's a lot of uh, um, remains around us, okay? There's lots of uh, uh, criteria, uh, and so it, it's, we have, we will have to assess, okay, the damage, and then realize all together uh, which resources we have. To, to bounce back okay this i think this is my feeling from my point of view yeah personal point of view yeah thank you adolfo i appreciate that uh okay. veronica i'm still hoping that we can hear you are you there oh okay well veronica uh if you if you pop on we'll we'll keep listening for you um vincent uh you just had some bad news uh about the festival being canceled and uh, one of your shows, Soprandra, was um, canceled and I believe your Cirque Alphonse shows were also canceled. Um, what repercussions are the artists struggling with now from these cancellations and have you given them any advice uh, for support? Um, yes, well actually uh, all over Quebec we're more under the shock of, uh, of the news. Uh, first, last Thursday, Thursday, our prime minister announced that there will be measure for salary people. But in Quebec, uh, probably 70 to 80 percent of the people that work in the show business are self-employed. Uh, so everybody reacted very strongly to that reality that uh, we're in deep, in deep shit. Um, luckily, we have a government that is very responsive to uh, the artist. Um, and uh, Monday, tomorrow morning, there is a big, big meeting with the Ministry of Cult the Minister of Culture, uh, Nathalie Roy, and all the associations and unions of artists to determine how they can cope with the financial reality of the, all those cancellations. Um, at this point, most Quebec artists uh, tour internationally. So I think in the last days, the challenge has to be finding tickets to go back home. Uh, last minute also. So that also brings another reality of now the shows are canceled. So we have no revenues, but we have to pay for all these changes of airfares and so on. Um, so that's something we have. I'm still trying to find a strategy to ask theaters that canceled us if they could give us a hand on that. Um, then the next challenge is everybody that is coming back will now be in quarantine for 14 days. So uh, 
so these people have to stay home but the whole business uh, all the all the artists all the acrobats uh, they will have no place where to uh, um, to rehearse so that that's at least at least for the next 14 days but honestly i believe it's going to be all the month of april and probably all the month of may so they're going to have a reality of how they're going to keep fit and how they're going to keep their level of uh, of um, discipline the acrobatic at this at the same height because when business is going to start back they'll need to be ready but will they be ready so that's something that will have to uh, to be addressed at some point um so that's pretty much what's worrying me uh, i didn't have any messages from very uh, worried artists uh now the national the national circus school is responding that the school is closed for the next two weeks and the all the graduates they have this uh, this uh, exam called épreuve synthèse in, in mid april that is will happen but with no lights only uh, the intern people of the school we attend to that normally it's not open to public but you have the families of the artists uh, of the acrobats that come that come to that so and for them they've been preparing for the last three years for that moment that's really the the moment where you get your diploma and can leave school and have a bright future so um so we hope that it will be fine mm -hmm. um as a perspective of agent it's really trying to deal with the force majeure article the clause in, in a contract you know uh at the beginning we had like france it's uh Cirque alphonse was touring france so they cut all events for 1000 and more now it's so the tour was was going on so uh, i think that's one thing you have to be thinking in all your future contracts is how to have a good force majeure clause that from the day it happens you're not just left by yourself you know uh, yeah so that's pretty much it uh, point. so, so I'm, I'm very happy to see that our government is really responding really well and i'm not talking about the canadian government who is i think quite lousy in their response uh the quebec government has been very uh, proactive and reassuring uh, towards the people and the, the all the people the working force Mm -hmm. So uh, that's quite uh, positive for us. Thank you, Vincent. Um, I do want to ask if anyone, if any other governments uh, from your different locations have had a similar response. But first, it looks like Veronica is here. So I'm going to give Veronica a chance to unmute their mic. Hello. Can you okay, introduce me? Last chance. <laughs> yeah. Last chance. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. You, you hear me. OK, yeah. so can I talk? <laughs> no, introduce yourself. Uh, okay, my name is Veronika Stefanova. I'm representing Cirkeon Center for Contemporary Circus in the Czech Republic, the umbrella organization for the Contemporary Circus in the Czech Republic. And maybe I can briefly describe the situation here in our country. Sure. Uh, the Czech Republic, yes? Mm -hmm. The yes, please. Czech Republic declared on Thursday, March 12, the state of emergency, uh, which means that government banned foreigners from entering the Czech Republic and Czechs traveling abroad. From Saturday, March 14, all bus, train and boat transport, passengers, uh, well, everything that is going from abroad or from Czech Republic abroad has been canceled because or it's not working, we can't cross the borders. Schools are closed, high schools, elementary schools, universities, all leisure centers, sports centers, circus centers, music school, etc. All shops uh, except grocery stores and pharmacies. So it's pretty much the same situation as in Italy. And today it's Sunday and we are waiting what the government is going to declare. But we are going to be put probably in the quarantine as well. Uh, all cultural, artistic and sport events must have been cancelled. So what does that mean? Especially for the NGO sector, which means independent and non-profit organizations. So in last couple of days, we heard mainly from the theaters and companies from the NGO sector, which means those companies that are not established and funded by the state, cities or regions. They stated that the government imposed restrictions on gathering people will deprive hundreds of thousands or millions of Czech crowns. For some, it could be the end of their existence and many artists may be put into very 
complicated financial difficulties. So the Ministry of Culture entrusted the Arts and Theatre Institute to map the impact of the emergency measures on the Czech independent arts sector. The data collection collected by the questionnaire survey should be submitted to the Ministry next week. So on Monday, which means tomorrow, the government should discuss also the material that would enable the self-employed to provide loans of up to half a million of crowns. They should primarily cover operational matters. So that's what they, we, we heard so far, but we will be more clever tomorrow, which is Monday, or probably not if there is quarantine. Yeah. That's amazing, Veronica. It sounds like your government is taking a lot of uh, proactive steps in, in Quebec as well. That's good to hear. Um, does anyone else have any details uh, specific to their government's actions that seem hopeful for the performing arts community uh, that go beyond just the trying to quell the, the, health, the health impacts? Or is it too soon for that? Nikki, uh, you, you have something to say? For the, there's a couple of us here in the U.S., but, you know, in terms of non-government responses, you know, we have such a dominant, that the private sector has such a dominant, you know, impact on, on us. And so, you know, over here we're having various utility companies suspend payments or offer options for folks who, um, you know, lose income to submit some sort of piece of information two months from now to waive, you know, um, service fees for electricity, gas, internet, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, in New York specifically, they've um, temporarily frozen evictions so that people aren't forced to leave an enclosed home space mm -hmm. uh, under the circumstances, although I don't really know what that's going to mean um, on the other side, whenever that is. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also, I've been seeing, I don't understand this a lot, um, but I saw someone post something on Facebook yesterday about some sort of um, cash assistance application for folks who aren't able to pay rent mm. uh, because of loss of employment, but I don't know how much money is available for that. I don't fully understand who's providing it, what the mm. terms are. Um, and, you know, my big question around that is, um, you know, it's just there's so many chains of money passage that it's like, where, where is it even, like, where do we, where do we start? Where do we stop in this kind of a circumstance? Right. Those are things that, um, that I've noticed here specifically that are happening um, from the private sector sort of jumping in because our government in the U.S. is, um, is slow. you know. Slow to react, yeah. Thank yeah. you, Nikki. <laughs> Nikki, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, the, the U.K. government has uh, has done a, a few things. I mean, it's, it's very focused on trying to keep business going as much as possible. Um, so, for example, it's changed its policies around how um, freelancers and self-employed people can access um, unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and it's looking at one-on-one uh, -on -one negotiations with in individuals about their tax payments, whether they can be deferred uh, till to a later date. Yeah. So there is there is some stuff happening, but again, most of their actions is focused around people who are actually suffering from illness or um, can demonstrate they've had to self isolate because of uh, because of coronavirus virus rather than loss of income due to prevention. Right. Yeah. yeah. We're dealing with the crisis right now rather than exactly. the prevention. Stefan, exactly. do you want to add something? Yes, hi. Um, on the link that I shared at the beginning, there is mm -hmm. a compilation of statements from different ministers. So the situation is evolving so quickly then that I think that a conversation that we can have cannot reach a very interesting point mm -hmm. be, uh, as far as this specific topic because mm -hmm. the discussion are happening right now. Mm -hmm. And again, there are larger than the cultural industry. So there are some things that are happening. I know in France, in Finland, in the UK, officially, there might be other things in other countries. And as soon as there is something which is official, which is something we should base ourselves on, it will be posted on, you know, for instance, this website or other website. So for now, problem. you can check it out. There are some information at least over there. And it's called On The Move, right? On the move .org or Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Okay. Um, I have, oh, Vicky, I'm sorry. 
Um, I, I was just going to say something in response to Stefan. I, I think um, it's really important that right now that we're gathering as much information to form our own kind of advocacy um, as, as much as possible, because looking at what's going on, conversations, even within equity, which is focused on the performing arts industry, circus has such specific and unique needs that it often falls between the cracks in those conversations. Right now, there is a crisis going on that's much, much bigger than the performing arts and, and our sector. But actually, it gives us some time right now to gather some information and some advocacy so that when the time is right, we can make the case. I agree. That's a smart point. Um, Adolfo, you were next, sir. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, I wanted to um, uh, add this up. OK, of course, uh, uh, we have to advocate together for Europeans, uh, international. And this is good that we have some reference organization in Europe. So active and so proactive. And uh, but the scale of this, of course, right now is uh, the main focus is for um, the entire institutions to face this, uh, this uh, virus back. We have uh, 100, more than 100, uh, almost 200 people dying every, every day here in Italy. So there's a lots of problems in the, in the hospital. So of course, there's lots of paper going on from one ministry to the other. There's uh, lots of uh, um, uh, questions and requests from different fields and also from the cultural ones, okay? But uh, to give you an idea, like uh, 10 days ago, the government was putting on the table 3 billion euros and uh, two days after it was 6 billion euros and then it was 13 and now it's 25 billion euros. And Germany has put 500 billion euros on the table the other day. So we, we still don't have uh, the, 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 the picture. We still don't have the picture. No. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Adolfo. Um, I have a question um, for anyone who wants to take it on. And that is, is there, do you think there's something about the infrastructure of, or something about circus in general, maybe the infrastructure of our networks um, that makes us, have an advantage for bouncing back from this uh, if, from this scenario. And Nikki, you seem ready to jump in. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about this um, honestly since before this. To be honest, I've been really interested in infrastructure in this sector, being in the U.S. where there really isn't any and mm -hmm. hasn't been for years, um, or there's sort of minimal or, or somewhat dysfunctional infrastructure. So, I think that this is potentially a really valuable opportunity for us to be in dialogue about asking questions and getting on the same page about values and intentions and the function of our art form and how we want to engage culturally as a as a collective you know um effort and by cre you know i think one thing that is we've many of us have encountered in panel discussions over at least i've encountered this over the last six years frequently is this question of like what is circus? And there's even disagreement or confusion within our own sector about mm -hmm. how to define what we do and who we are and how we relate within a genre. But there's also variations within our genre. And I think that, you know, including the fact that performing arts in terms of people coming together and gathering could look very different two years from now or five years from now, depending on, or three months from now versus five years from now or whatever it is. And being able to get creative and flexible, both about how to be be adaptable to a changing circumstance in which we can still engage with what we do, but also an opportunity to get more specific in our language together about how we function in the collective and ways that we can better support each other because we are on a similar page where it seems that through until this point, there's been a lot of regional isolation, both mm -hmm. in terms of aesthetic and in terms of practice, and then also in terms of economic resource. So being able to even identify what's different about those, what's functional, what's not, you know, I think this is even an opportunity to examine the field's relationship to capitalism. You know, mm -hmm. I think the economy could have a really different reality. And I think that there'll be conversations about that probably happening in other sectors, but to be also open and available to what might it look like if we were to engage in a more cooperative way, for example, or whatever it might be. Sure. So um, I'm interested in, you know, there's a couple of resources that I've always been interested in around this. You know, one is Adrian Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, which I've 
referenced before in these kind of conversations, I think is really valuable in a time like this. Mm -hmm. um, and in the US, we have a podcast. Uh, there's, a, there's an organization called Lift Economy, L-I-F-T. Um, mm -hmm. They have a podcast called Next Economy Now, where they talk to folks who have either social justice organizations or for-profit organizations that take on different and sort of more ethically and res responsible, sustainable um, movements of money. And I mm -hmm. think that looking at those kinds of look at those kinds of examples and sort of with the kinds of um, more uh, maybe poetic questions we ask as artists and the sort of things that we want to do um, with our work, that sort of that interface and being able to be in that dialogue could yes. yield really cool. I agree. That's a good point. Thank you for sharing that. It uh, looks like Veronica and then Deb have something to say. And then Matt, it looked like you also. So let's go Veronica, Deb, Matt, Stefan. <laughs> Veronica, you're up. Okay. <laughs> you can still hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, I just wanted to add something, probably not uh, not exactly the answer on this question, but you were uh, asking about the circus field and how the circus field could react on everything. And I would definitely would like to say that everything happened so fast all the venues and uh, theaters were closed here on Tuesday and already on Tuesday evening, our famous and one of the biggest circus company, Circla Putica, which comes from the NGO sector, which is independent and non-government uh, organization. It was the first one that went online. They showed their live show online and they asked people for a donation and it worked very well. So the, they decided to create a platform. Well, we will see tomorrow. Everything could change in an hour. So I can't tell how it will look like tomorrow. But Circla Putica proposed to other circus artists and performers a platform for online streaming. So that is kind of now the thing that is happening in the Czech Republic and circus field that shows are going live online. And there is a private sector that decided to help circus artists, but all the independent artists by a donation and created an online platform and people could add money or send money to the artist. That's a brilliant idea. I've been wondering how that would pick up. I'm sure a lot of online content and online uh, productions will definitely be happening in coming months. Um, Deb, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think it, it, I agree with Nikki there that um, this can be an opportunity and that's one of the things artists are particularly good at, seeing seeing the positive where everyone else sees the negative. Um, I agree too with the online streaming. We've got a show that's supposed to open in Vancouver um, on the uh, 14th of um, April for three weeks, the show's there. And the theatre, I mean, I haven't spoken to them this weekend, but I'd say that's looking increasingly unlikely. We haven't cancelled it yet, but it, I'm pretty sure it will be cancelled. But I've started to work on how we can um, stream directly so the because it's a very interactive show, the artists need to be able to have an audience, they need to see an audience. Mm -hmm. So I've spoken to someone here in Brisbane as to how we can set up an audience so that they can see the Vancouver people um, and then try and get the theatre to take that on um, rather than cancel the show and just see whether this is something that we can do. I also think it's another opportunity to look at how we move things around, in, like our equipment and our and our freight and things like this, which takes, like I was talking to our, Glo our freight company the other day and they've got freight all over the world trying to get it, people are trying to get it home. Yeah. Um, and that's sets and um, especially big bands and things like that. Everyone's taking everything home and um, then it's all going to have to go out again. And I've been asking about 3D printing and how we can start to do more of that with our, with our sets and with our equipment mm -hmm. and haven't been able to get really any good answers because it's completely outside my, my realms of experience. So I think personally that um, it is an opportunity for us to do things differently and that that we we're going to try and take some time to try and do some at least one or two of those things to see how it goes um and and then see how we can build on that so that it can become something that stays the new normal that's a good point deb and i'm sure that will develop more as time goes by after the crisis level of um illnesses especially once things die yeah. down well, um, we've had we, oh, sorry but 
We've just had a show come home from France. One closed in Berlin for 30 days and the artists are stuck there. Um, we've got artists stuck in France and um, we've got, we've just brought people home from Albuquerque. And so it's quite like they've all, they're all in confinement now mm -hmm. um, or they're stuck. And it's, yeah, it's just really, really difficult um, yeah. having people stuck in foreign countries. And having to support them remotely just just emotionally, I'm sure, is pretty intense while they're worried about yeah. being far from loved ones and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what shows are, do you have in Ber What show did you have in Berlin in France that shut down? Um, it was the, there's a festival there that Cassis were performing at called a show with you and I, and uh -huh. I can't think of the name of the festival um, at the moment. And Le Coup is in Berlin at Chameleon. Mm -hmm. So Chameleon's shut for thirty days. Veronica, I have a question for you specifically, and, and also anyone else that's involved in any future uh, festival planning. Now, like Letney Letna is in August, right? Uh, do you think at this point that people are starting to question whether they should cancel so early for these kind of things, or are they kind of just to see how things go? Uh, I'm uh, in touch with festival Letni Letna, and there are no rumors about canceling the festival or the shows at the moment. There are mm -hmm. festivals that decided to cancel, mostly theater festivals in May, because for them the situation now means they were about to announce the program, So, but it would be completely stupid to do it now. So the, let's say, April and May festivals, there are, mm -hmm. but there, yeah, there's one circus festival in April in the Czech Republic, which is focused on the women in circus, and I'm still waiting for the answer from the festival if it's going to be cancelled or not. But concerning those big festivals, such as like Niletna, at the moment, we still believe it will go on. But it's Sunday. We will see tomorrow and next week. Thank you. Um, Matthew and then Vincent. Matthew, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and then Stefan. <laughs> no worries. So um, what I'm actually addressing is not specifically circus, but in the physical disciplines that include that. Yeah, obviously, with the activities that we have in Taiwan, they're not uh, government specific because they're spread. However, look at uh, the, the supply chains. If they're set for art, there's artists and artisans. And it's not about the, the technicians aren't just in black. There's the technical fields. There are many people that depend on this sector of activity beyond the onstage performers whose careers may be shorter and a bit more fragile in a certain sense because of what they need to do to maintain the skills. Not just the physical conditioning, doing Pilates is fantastic, but it doesn't replace the complicity of working on the refined skill, things that you can't do uh, on a Pilates ball. But with the artisans, I'm looking at Dubai, the uh, Expo 2020, which is rocking, maybe the, the Tokyo Games being compromised, which is immense. Not necessarily about our industry, but what that does to all those supply chains that are there. It's huge. So in terms of the force majeure that uh, Vincent was speaking about earlier, the force majeure has always been sort of what they call in English, they call it a, an, an act of God which is a bit of a different uh, translation, force majeure, I prefer uh, than making a religious responsibility there. But the contingencies that sit in budgets and everything, and the force majeure has always been sort of like out clause for investors to not pay people. Uh, and we've dealt with a lot of force majeure in hurricanes and thus and such, and I've been in big tops where force majeure comes into play all the time. So I think that there's a lesson coming here about the prospecting. Okay. Um, the, the sand castle. I think that Expo 2020 is a sand castle of sand, very near a beach with a big wave coming in that just did. And um, there's a lot of activity there, but we're really going to have to look at um, not only our artistic activity and the structures that supply schools or academies or even uh, performances. There are an innumerable quantity of artisans that are going to go out of business like that. And it's happening already. There are people whose contracts were not being paid because the deliverables weren't there. Uh, all this stuff. We all know that there have been a lot of campaign that if you bought a ticket, which costs $75, don't ask for a refund now because you'll kill our activity and our cultural supply chain, if you will. It sounds terrible to talk about culture as a supply chain, but it is intrinsic. What I want to do is actually underscore the fact that it's an artery. If you squeeze the artery, you squeeze the circulation. You can call it an artery, you can call it a supply chain, you can call it anything you want. But these arteries are being constricted. So when we open up again, which we all will do, 
I think that in a, in, a, in a field, as a field, we really need to analyze where we do our budgetary contingencies and where we deal with just the fact that we know that there are things beyond our control that may need to be compensated for us, but that we don't squeeze our arteries. I think we need to just kind of level some of the prospecting so that we don't go, well, sorry, force majeure, bye. Because actually now it's not working on a global scale. We're going to wind up killing our, our, uh, our field. And I think that that largely depends on the health of the of the company to begin with, the company that's well placed. And that's there's no company that can take this on. I'm telling you, I'm, we're working with people that that uh, working in casinos in Macau, which was the biggest profit margin in the planet. Yeah. And that's that artery has been constricted instantly. So with the way we're sitting now, it's it's there's a there's a difference between a reality check and a rude awakening. Mm -hmm. This is now beyond the reality. This is a rude awakening. So we need yeah. to actually take that on differently. And I don't like to talk about casinos in Macau. I've also, I come from culture, but the, that's why I use the artery metaphor. So depending on the, the artery, the size of the artery or capillaries, it's a circulatory uh, thing. We need to really look at what we're doing here. Thank you. There are a lot of that are going out of business. We need to support them too. I agree. Vincent, um, did you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, I think uh, as a developer of uh, tours for companies, it's quite preoccupying because uh if things go on and honestly uh I, i'm worried for one country very much it's usa uh usa doesn't have a real public system so they're not in the ability to cope with what's going to happen uh their president is just showing no the things not to do <laughs> not being tested uh, but especially that they're not able they won't be able to cope because it's as uh, as our friend Nikki, it's nikki eh? Uh, said uh, it's a private sector and uh, it's not for common good, it's for profit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very, very worried for, for that sector of the world that USA is going to hit and it's going to hit hard and it's mm -hmm. going to take a long time before things get better. Luckily, uh, from all the what I read is that uh, in summer with the warmth, uh, the virus don't stand the warmth so well. No, we don't know. Uh, but um so, so edinburgh is uh, the, the fringe in edinburgh is very important the montreal complete Manciac is very important the avignon is very important for all those companies to uh, to be able to set tours for the upcoming years mm -hmm. so what's going to happen is really worrying because uh because a company will need to work in uh one year from now and have their their shows on the road eh? so mm -hmm. that's that's very preoccupying um well so uh i just touch wood cross fingers and try to find solutions to be able to to present our shows to programmers to be able to have those shows on the road in a year or two from now you know yeah vincent thank you that's a very good point um about how uh, fragile this whole system is depending on the su the spring and summer markets and um I, vicky's next but i just wanted to mention that matthew said in the chat and i think this is a good point that um australia it's summer there right now right deb and we're still experiencing um the, the health problems from the COVID 19 so whether or not it slows down still remains to be seen but that's not a good sign um vicky you're up um, yeah i was i was going to say that one of the things that this virus has exposed is, is problems that existed in our system uh, before the virus that now have come to into sharp focus because we're having to deal with them on a really, really large scale. Mm -hmm. So the idea of force majeure in contracts in um, in UK, force majeure comes into existing agreements and it's, it's really coming into play that for shows that are already running um, and failure pro to produce, which is another clause that um, deals with things that are in production agreements that are yet to be made. Um, it's really clear that there is a real imbalance in where the risk sits. And quite often that risk sits with touring companies and independent artists. Um, and one of the things that equity is looking at um, in the short term and in the long term, I guess, is, is how it can redesign that its existing contracts so that that risk is something that is more shared. Um, and doesn't fall to the, the what is normally the weakest link to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, would, that go to? would that go to venues and producers and and uh, funding sources? So, for example, at the moment, um, you know, if you're a producer and you're running a show in the UK at the, um, and you have force majeure in your contract, uh, you know, a contract will deal with 
clauses that the producer that is under the control of the producer and things that are not within the control of the producer. So force majeure at the moment is not really within the control of the producer. You you don't have any um uh any influence over what happens with the coronavirus, what happens with government legislation. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of producers, that means that they can step away from contracts with minimal recourse to the artists that um, that they've engaged. And that's mm -hmm. a real problem. Mm -hmm. I see your point. Um, thank you, Vicky. Stefan, I'm sorry, I jumped over you. It's your turn. No problem. So uh, I'm just going to be a little bit provocative because um, I'd just like to have fun with this. And you're French. With being, and I'm French. I'm allowed to, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, and also, I'm very bad with, um, you know, having a conversation without having a beer. Actually, so <laughs> <laughs> I cannot just talk like this. Um, right so, um, as some of you pointed out, yes, I agree. It's an opportunity, and I think it's funny that we're having this opportunity because we're forced to have it. Uh, thanks to a virus but um we might be forced in the future to have this kind of opportunity for other reasons like i don't know maybe climate change and for me it goes beyond rethinking how what we do and yeah it's all very nice the online 3d printing whatever you want but i would like to push the rethinking a little bit further and maybe we should rethink the whole system and the whole capitalistic system around this and the work processes and i mean i don't want to say hashtag destroy capitalism but it's a bit where i'm going with this um i think there is going to be a definitely um a specific impact for circus because it has a specific uh, because it has specificities and I believe and I hope that circus will have specific reactions as well however we need to have a common response between the performing arts and also largely be between other sectors and the one thing that strikes me is that um, one of the specificities uh, is that circus is very much international so this issue uh, and the fact that it's international and the fact that mobility is hindered right now shows how fragile the whole thing is. So that's what I'm interested in and see how we can counterbalance this as a, let's say, as a, as a test, because this will probably happen in the future. And, uh, you know, so we have events, for instance, in April, and I'm set to say yes. I don't want to say it's cancelled. <laughs> I want to say I'm going to transform this event. I'm going to give you the content. This is going to be a capacity building opportunity. It's just going to be different. And I'm going to try to learn new skills and share new skills. But I also try to show, I think, what is important right now, instead of having a conversation about how the virus spread. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I trust the medical authorities, in, at least in my countries, to tell me to give me medical information because I'm not a doctor, um, but is to show solidarity and also to give concrete solidarity opportunities to the people we know. So that's what I'm interested in right now. Thank you. That's a very, very good point um, about trying to still deliver in a new way. Um, and I think that, you know, you're, by working together, by being international, um, and by communicating uh, opportunities, we might be able to still salvage some spring and summer things. I don't know. I'm, just, I'm hoping. I don't know. Uh, Nikki, did you want to add something? You were on in line. Um, well, Stefan, I want to applaud everything you just said because I, I was going to touch on some of those points, but you. Um, you really put it in a whole systems context better than I probably would have. But I was going to bring up the point of climate change as like connected to these questions around touring. You know, we're talking about picking up touring, but then there's also the consideration of, you know, while we're at it, remembering and recognizing that plane travel, you know, gas emissions, these things could significantly change in the next 10 to 15 years. And what, you know, if we are going to be talking about infrastructure, you know, there's, I think in line with these economic questions and artistic questions also are the questions around how can we, how can we create um, 
strong local, um, you know, systems that are prepared to be adaptable to these additional changes that we know we can anticipate mm -hmm. that will make the sort of 20th century model not relevant anymore. You know, I think that's a really real factor when we're talking about infrastructure, not just talking about sanitizing stuff, but also, um, you know, what are the other things that we can recognize will be different going forward from here and how can we engage with those? So that's all I was gonna add to that. Are we gonna become hyper-local as far as the arts, performing arts? Are we going to use technology? Will that reduce the effect of an art? Because as we know, it's not the same as being there in person. Is that just something that we'll have to adapt to? Um, those are the questions, yeah. Did anyone else wanna add anything? Uh, Matthew and then Veronica. Yeah, I also had the, the look of this spending about 25 years of my life on tour. And the uh, it's not Tupperware. You come in with a Tupperware, you take off the lid, you put people in, and then you go somewhere. I think what, uh, what Nikki's talking about is an interesting way of looking at it. I know that there's a great deal of a local interface with many of the tours that we do from staffing and also from a lot of other things. And if there were more forward thinking in terms of the eco ecological aspect as well, and also just the cultural uh, contagion in a positive way, <laughs> There are a lot of local infrastructures that, are, that exist that could be solicited locally without bringing it as an imported product. Of course, you master it differently. There's more planning. There's a huge amount of, uh, of um, logistic conditions to be taken on in terms of that. But personally, uh, I've actually engaged very often and not for financial gain, local artists every single time I come in to do all that. And a lot of cross-pollination culturally as opposed to just coming in and selling tickets, which as the Cirque du Soleil is very easy to do. Yeah, I got the brand and People come in and buy tickets and then you leave. But there's a great deal of interface there. And actually, uh, with that touring tool, I've been able to uh, stimulate a great deal of cross-pollination and a great deal of uh, growth within certain local ideas. I think some of the, the, the philosophy around touring is to come in as an itinerant art rather than coming in and just planting your stuff. Like I say, the Tupperware, you, you just take off the lid, put some people in it, and walk away with some cash. And I think that there is something to be uh, developed amongst ourselves to make that as a proposition rather than just as a philosophical, philosophical suggestion. Yeah. Veronica, did you want to add? Very quickly. Thank you, Stefana, for the topic you opened. You opened another 100 questions, and I don't have any answers. I just would like to add to this touring thing and international, let's say, principle of contemporary circus. Without touring and us going abroad, there would be no contemporary circus in the Czech Republic. And we still need to travel. We still need to send our people abroad so they can study and bring the circus back into our country. So this is also a huge question for the future. Just wanted to add this. This is a very good point. Um, it's not as simple as just putting everything online, obviously. Um, but at the moment, this is where we're at, just brainstorming these ideas. Um, I think this is a conversation that will continue offline and online, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do a follow-up uh, report. But um, first, I want to thank everyone for spending the time with us today and talking to us about your sector. And I hope we have a chance to follow up with you soon. Um, every resource that you've shared with us in this conversation, please send me a message uh, of it so we can put it in our post so everyone has access to it. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much, everyone. It's been a great conversation.